Fab. Thank you very much. Um, just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining us. This is our last uh, ASIG talk of this year. Um, so it should be a really interesting one. We've got um, Dr. Richard Young joining us today and he's the Managing Director of Nature Positive. I won't give too much away because I think he's going to give an introduction for himself anyway. But just to say that if there are any questions or anything like that, as we're going through them, please just pop them in the chat. We're going to have some time at the end for discussion and questions and that kind of thing um, as we go. But uh, without further ado, let me hand over to Richard Young. Thank you. Thanks, Annie, and um, good evening to everybody. Um, it's been a while since I've done a, a Zoom presentation, so I hope this goes smoothly. Um, so, yes, I'm, uh, as Annie said, Managing Director of a biodiversity consultancy called Nature Positive, but really I'm speaking um, about uh, some work that I was involved in in my last role, which was a Director of Science and Training at the Nature Conservation Charity, Doral Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, so I've been part of a, um, a global uh, group um, to develop something called the IUCN Green States of Species, and that's what I'm going to be speaking about today. But I'm really speaking on behalf of lots and lots of people, and particularly my ex-colleague, uh, Rebecca Young, no relation of me, but um, has basically been leading a lot of, a lot of this work. Um, so my title um, of the talk is Survival Thrive, the IUCN Green States of Species which was a title that I um, uh, came up with second after my first title, Des said that it was basically a bit too dull and therefore I needed something punchy, but clearly that, that message hasn't got through. But anyway, I'm still talking about the same thing. I'll be interested at the end of the, um, the talk actually, but who's actually heard of the IUCN Green States of Species because we're really interested in understanding the extent to which it's been promoted. But essentially the Green States of Species um, is a product of IUCN, the World Conservation Union, and it is a framework for fully assessing the conservation status of species. And the thrive, or the survive or thrive bit, is really um, to get across the message that conservation is, is particularly global species conservation, threatened species conservation, is always negatively framed. And we need to think about what's been achieved in terms of species recovery to date, because there's been huge amounts of successes in conservation, but also what's possible in the future. So the Green States of Species is all about lifting conservation ambition from just stopping wildlife deteriorating, going extinct, to actually enabling it to more fully recover. Recover. So I've been part of this effort since around about 2017, thereabouts, to develop this new framework. Um, and it's involved, the working group is around about 20 or so people, but with a core group that I'm involved in of about eight that's really driven this. And it has to be said that a lot of it has been done um, through in people's spare time. So a big global effort, been gone on quite a few years, a lot of progress to go. Um, in terms of this talk, I'm going to introduce you to the framework, describe what it's all about, um, take you through kind of the methods in brief about how you go and about assess a species according to the green, green status of a species, give you a few examples about what that looks like and what that tells you, um, and also um, some research that we did basically testing the framework to see whether or not it can be applied in reality. Uh, and then the work so far, although it's not progressed as much as we'd expected to apply this framework, not at a global level for the global range of species, but at a program level, just try and understand what impact conservation programs. And so the partners at the bottom of the slide here, Dora Wildlife, San Diego Zoo, Zoological Society of London, Rewild, um, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, University of Oxford are all people part, uh, all partners in that effort to apply this framework at a program level. Okay, let's start. So, the green states of species, as I say, it's an IUCN product, and it is woven into something called the IUCN Red List, which I'm hoping needs no introduction. You'll all be familiar with that, but it's an incredibly widely used tool um, in conservation as a way of assessing um, extinction risk. So assessing the likelihood of whether a species is going to go extinct to the near future. And it's a global standard. It's been around for a long time. It's, it's really well established. It's really well known. Um, and it's used a lot for not, not prioritizing conservation action, but certainly informing it. So the green state of species is woven into the red list and you'll see a kind of, you know, a, a physical manifestation of that later on. But the, but the red list actually really only tells us so much in terms of the conservation story of a species. So let's take the case of the saltwater crocodile. Um, 
You can see here it's global distribution um, uh, in Southeast Asia into Australasia. And in green is where there are currently established populations and the species are doing quite well. Uh, and in orange or, or red, perhaps on your screen, is where the species has likely been extirpated um, through human actions uh, and therefore is completely missing from its historical range. So just glimpsing at the map, you can see it's doing pretty well, really well in Australia, Australasia, Papua New Guinea, um, Sumatra, Borneo, Sulawesi and so forth, but entirely absent from the Philippines and up into Indo Indochina. So if you think about this species, the conservation status of species, it's OK in some parts, but really not in others. But because the red list essentially only uh, assesses extinction risk, um, uh, it only tells you part of the story. So on the, on the ICM red list, it's down as least concern. So the implication of that is we really don't need to worry about the saltwater crocodile um, at all at global level. And of course, that's true in parts of its range, but it's certainly not true in others. So it's really telling us only part of the story. So we started asking the question, well, what, given the saltwater crocodile's story and others, what do we mean by when a species is fully recovered? So back in 2018, we published a paper um, which sets out the conceptual framework for what was then known as the green list of species. It's, it's now had a, had a, a branding change, um, but really is yeah, not just think about extinction risk, but to think about the species for a uh, full, full recovery. And so this is a definition. It's based on other people's work, but the definition um, that we came up with is that we consider a species fully recovered if it is viable, ecologically functional, uh, and in each part of both those states in each part of its indigenous range, i.e. it's represented across fully across its indigenous range. And we'll look at what we mean by viable, ecologically functional, and represented in each part of its indigenous range at the moment. But that's the IUCN accepted def definition of when we can consider a species being fully recovered. So as I say, IUCN Red List sets out this framework for, for um, uh, assessing extinction risk, and the IUCN green sets of species is now a new part of the red list and assesses how close or how far from uh, full recovery is a species. And it's really important to, and to, for, for a framework for understanding the past and potential future importance of conservation action species recovery. And just like the IUCN red list has a standard, so does the IUCN green states species, which was published a couple of years ago. So if you're interested very much, go and have a look at that, at that standard. So at its heart, the group status framework is all about trying to see species not just survive, but thrive. And we'll go look at the framework in detail in a minute, but essentially it is there to do five things. So first of all, as I say, is to provide that standardized framework that can be applied across multiple species, multiple geographies, taxa, jo um, different uh, ecological settings to measure species recovery to answer that fundamental question, how far is a species from being fully recovered or how depleted it is? Secondly, it's there to answer the question, what has conservation achieved to date? And that's something in green status terms we call the conservation legacy. How dependent are species on continued conservation action? I'm sure many of you can think of examples of species that would decline if it wasn't for ongoing conservation actions that we refer to as conservation dependence. But then we think about the future. So how will conservation actions impact the speech, species in, in the near future? And we refer to that as conservation gain. We'll come back to these terms in a bit more detail. And then thinking really long term, what level of species recovery can we strive to achieve um, over, as I say, over very long term? And we, know, we refer that to as recovery potential. Just how far uh, can we get with the species in terms of recovery? So the green set of species is set out to do five things. If you think about the red list, it arguably does one thing, it assess, assesses and characterizes, categorizes extinction risk. The green status therefore is a much more involved and in-depth framework. So let's take an example, um, a pretty high profile conservation example of the California condor, um, just to break down that definition of full recovery. So we consider, as I say, a species fully recovered if it's viable, ecologically functional, in each part of its indigenous range. And here, this blue polygon sitting on the Western seaboard of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, is what we understand the, in, the, the indigenous range prior to major human impact of the Californian condor. So to do that, essentially, is a process of mapping 
all known, inferred, and spatially projected sites of occurrence, both current and historical. And in the green sets of species, the standard sets out that essentially the default baseline year is 1750, which is the IPCC definition of the beginning of the industrial era where you see large scale transformation of ecosystems. There's lots of debates about what a best baseline year is for understanding pre-human impact range. And in certain parts of the world, this works quite well. In other parts, it doesn't. But that was the, the decision we came to on balance at 1750 was about right. So we're looking really trying to understand before human interference. And of course, humans have interfered and disrupted wildlife and ecosystems for, for millennia. Um, uh, but we, we felt, again, 1750 was a, about a, a good trade off in terms of a, of a consistent baseline year. So the job is to map that indigenous range as best you can. And then we want to understand um, representation across that range. So the job therefore is to capture ecological variation that might have existed across that, um, that indigenous range of the species, um, because we're really interested in trying to incentivize the conservation action across the range. If you think about, the, for example, that saltwater crocodile. And the various ways and means of dividing up that indigenous range, but essentially looking for um, where subpopulations might have existed. So these are these are populations that have very little genetic uh, movement or movement of individuals or gen genetic transfer between them. There are lots of ways and lots of guidance about how we can do this. The assessment team here um, essentially recognised five different spatial units that probably captures the most of the ecological variation of the um, uh, a Californian condor before major human impact. And you can see those mapped out there. In dark green is the no is the current um, range of the species. So you, from the little dot up here through to these, these larger polygons and down into Baja California. So the so the green status framework, you need to start mapping out the kind of the different parts of the of the indigenous range once occupied by the species. And then we want to understand something about whether it's vi viable in each of those spatial units. Um, and we also, to be able to do that then, um, we apply red list criteria and we assess viability about a, a subpopulation about essentially whether it, it would be classified as least concerned in that, in that range. So it wouldn't be threatened within that, within that spatial unit uh, or indeed near threatened, but not declining. So viability is relatively straightforward. I say in inverted commas to assess in each of these spatial units. So essentially you want a population that's robust in the long term and it's got little chance of going extinct within the spatial unit. Uh, but we also, we don't just want viability, we want that species to, to perform its full range of ecological functions. And that's much more difficult to assess. But the aspiration is um, essentially for a species to exhibit this full range of ecological interactions and functions within that ecosystem. And you take the example of California condor, it has a number of uh, important ecological functions, one of which is um, ex uh, feeding, uh, is an obligate carrion feeder, so uh, nutrient uh, and therefore nutrient cycling. So you're trying to understand about whether or not a population, a subpopulation, a spatial unit is both viable, but also at a density um, and an age structure, a demographic structure that's likely to be performing those ecological functions. Quite difficult to assess, but that's the aspiration of the framework. So how, so those are the core concepts. How do you do that in reality? So you define the species indigenous range, a lot of mapping, a lot of historical data gathering. It's a big challenge, but it, I'll, I'll show you that it has been done and it is possible to do. You then make some decisions about how you divide that range into different spatial units. For highly restricted species, that could be just a single spatial unit up to perhaps 15 to 20 for, for um, a large wide ranging species. You then assess the species status in each unit, and you basically decide whether it's absent from that spatial unit, present, viable, or functional. And then essentially you work out a species recovery score. There's a spreadsheet that does it all for you, and depending on the states and those different spatial units, it, it weights them and gives you a score. So that's the um, rather simple equation um, that allows you to calculate the species recovery score. Uh, you can see the, the equation there, but essentially, um, it is the kind of the total sum of those uh, states in all the spatial units divided by the total number of spatial units. So it would get a maximum score of 100%, where a species would be functional and viable in all parts of its range. 
Um, so it's not it's fully recovered or not depleted. And the minimum score, of course, zero percent means that the species is extinct in the wild. So we look at that again in the case of the California condor. Um, here are its five spatial units that have been selected. Um, and you essentially assess whether or not it is present, absent, present, um, viable or functional in each of those spatial units. Um, and that those are its states. Essentially, it's absent from one of those historical um, parts of its range and be largely because of reintroductions. In fact, wholly because of reintroduction, because this was extinct in the wild, is now present in four of them. So you apply um, those um, that equation uh, and essentially what you come up with here on the right hand side, you can see it has a species recovery score of 27%. So very, very far from being fully recovered, of course. I'll explain and contextualize that number uh, a little bit later, but, it, but it's a relatively straightforward way of trying to understand, trying to quantify the extent to which or how far away or close a species is from full recovery as defined by that definition I mentioned earlier. So that's one job of the green states of species to understand the current species um, uh, recovery score, how far it is being from fully recovered, but there are four other jobs for it to do. So we're gonna take a hypothetical species now. So uh, a species might have a current species of recovery score of around about 40%. But what does that mean in terms of its conservation story? So the other thing that the framework allows you to do is to develop so-called counterfactual assessments of the state of the species. So this is where you, you play out a logical argument, a hypothetical logical argument about where a species would likely be today if no conservation actions had taken place at all for that species from the baseline year of a charity selected at 1950. So if no conservation actions had taken place, what would be the states of that species and all those different spatial units, and therefore what would the species recovery score be today? As you can see here, hypothetically, it would have a much lower species recovery score, and the difference between the current uh, uh, score with conservation compared to the current factual with no conservation is what is known as the conservation legacy. And that gives you an estimate of what the impact has been of that past conservation, uh, conservation actions. So that's looking back in the past. We also, the framework also allows us to look up into the future. So if you have the data and you have an understanding of the, of the species in sufficient detail, you can start make, uh, constructing scenarios about where that species might be in the short term. In this case, the framework uh, demands 10 years. It's aligned with the red list criteria about 10, about 10 years or three generations, whatever is the shorter, uh, which is the longer, I beg your pardon. Um, but in this case, it's pegged on 10 years. And it gives you, you run a scenario about what would that species recovery score be today, given the state, likely state of those species and those different spatial units without ongoing and planned conservation actions. And that gives you an understanding about the dependence of the species against the current baseline. So against what would be the current species recovery score, um, how much would it decline as a result of conservation actions not happening? It also allows you to look uh, ahead in the future um, with conservation. So all planned and uh, sorry, all ongoing and planned conservation actions, if they were delivered as planned and they would be as effective as as expected, effective as expected, where would that species be today? And that's called the difference between that and the current baseline is called gain. So it allows you to, to run a scenario about where you might reasonably expect that species to be in terms of its species recovery score. Uh, in 10 years time. And the framework also, uh, and the assessment approach also allows you to look even further in the future to think of in the very long term, which is aligned with typical 100 year visions you might see in a species uh, action plan or a species recovery strategy. So it allows you to play out a thought experiment about where um, a species could reasonably expect it to, to be in 100 years time given aspects of its biology, but also given very real life constraints about available habitat left. Um, is very it is very difficult to predict and you're having to make large assumptions which you declare, um, but this is what's called rec your recovery potential. So it's your reasonable expectation given the biology of the species and a lot of the threat factors that are operating today and how those might play out in the future, but where that species could be in a hundred years given what we know today. So those 
But that is essentially is the framework. Really quite involved. Um, it requires a lot of understanding of the species and the conservation efforts. But again, it allows us to start running scenarios about where we might expect a species to be with and without conservation actions into the future. OK, I'll pause a second just to let you know in terms of thinking about this framework, but just to let you know that a lot of this is mapped out in the IUCN Green States of Species uh, standard, which is freely available um, on the IUCN website and other places. But also just to let you know, there's a lot. There's been a lot of science published trying to uh, in the background to this framework development. So, for example, there was one in biological conservation a couple of years ago, which sets out how you go about building these robust, practicable counterfactuals and scenarios to to allow the the future and past impacts of conservation actions to be um, assessed. So that that's um, underpins a lot of the sort of thought process behind this, as is another paper in conservation biology, which that which talks about and outlines an approach for assessing ecological function in the context of species recovery. This one is particularly challenging, but it just set, sets out some thoughts and approaches for standardised ways that you might assess ecological function. OK, so that's the theory. That's kind of how it's meant to work. But how deliverable is the green status? So when we spent lots of time in lots of meeting rooms in lots of places around the world thinking about conceptually about this framework, but of course, just like the red list, it relies on volunteers, essentially volunteers, so subject matter experts, taxon specialists, essentially to do these assessments. It's probably one of the big flaws of the IUCN red list is that it re re relies on this, on specialist groups, IUCN specialist groups, who essentially give up their time for free, often in a voluntary capacity. They're struggling to do that. So how on earth can they add on a green status uh, assessment on top of that? Um, uh, is a very reasonable kind of practical challenge, I suppose, that was aimed at us when we were thinking about this. So we wanted to test it out. Uh, we published a paper in 2021, I think, Conservation Biology, um, which does much of this is massive co uh, multi co author paper that you can see on the right, testing this global standard for quantifying species recovery and conservation impact. So we selected multiple different tax across, you know, multiple different taxonomic groups, geographies, knowledge levels, and red list categories to try and get a representative slice of biodiversity. Um, essentially to be able to see whether or not this conceptual framework, this framework will, can be applied in reality. So we had about 200 people across 52 IUCN specialist groups, 38 countries involved, assessing 100, 181 different taxa. So to how, how to apply this framework. The summary was actually um, it was really applicable. Um, it was really deliverable. Um, there was a lot, quite a lot of support given to the assessment teams, but essentially in terms of time input inputs, it wasn't really unreasonable. Um, the framework and the assessment tool, which sits in Excel, was actually quite easy, intuitive to follow, and essentially we got green sets assessments out for these 181 ta uh, taxa. As part of that, we we tested out a way of building uncertainty into the assessments. So assessors are asked to give their minimum and maximum as well as most plausible scores. And we also tested out people's ability to think counterfactually about what would happen if conservation actions hadn't in the past and also in the future. So we were really pleased with the results of this. Um, the framework really, really held up. And that also allows us across to all those taxa to look at the spread of different species recovery scores today for all those um, different species, all those different mammals, plants, invertebrates, fungi, and so forth. And this graph here shows you uh, a number of species on the y-axis, but just the spread of different species recovery scores from zero to 100. You can see groupings around uh, some round numbers, um, but essentially also what it allowed us to do is to make decisions about how to categorize these data so to turn the species recovery scores into species recovery categories. And you can see here, there's lots of long conversations about how, about the terminology here, but you can see here from right from the right hand end, a species is fully recovered or non-depleted through these different categories of slightly to moderately to largely to critically depleted right through to extinct in the wild. And I'd encourage you to look at, to look at this paper about some of the, um, the other results we got there as well. So we're able to turn those species recovery scores into what we think are it's sort of intuitive categories of depletion, or indeed the flip side of that is recovery. But also that paper, that study allowed us also to um, apply 
categories to the numeric values that we're getting for conservation legacy, uh, dependence gain and potential. And perhaps a little bit less interesting perhaps, but we decided on a rather simple high, medium, low uh, to zero categorization um, of legacy gain, dependence and potential, but also indeterminate where essentially just the data weren't solid enough or weren't confident enough in the data to become to, to, to come up with these categories. So what does this look like? Um, well, now for around about 40, I believe, or maybe it's 50 species now, you can go on the ICM red list and look at the green status assessment alongside the red list assessment. So let's take the example of the Sumatran rhino. According to the red list, it's critically endangered. Just a few, um, a few tens of individuals left in really fragmented populations across, uh, uh, largely across Borneo. Um, so critically endangered, right on the brink of extinction, and you'd be the unsurprised to hear, therefore, that its green status category is critically depleted. So this is the, the summary of its green status assessment. Um, you can see here this species declined really rapidly um, since the 1950s. It was doing pretty well, but with, with huge swathes of uh, forest, wet forest in that part of the world being given over to agriculture, massive declines in the species, but also combined with and synergistically uh, combined with um, the effects of, of poaching. So today, species recovery score is, uh, score is extremely small. Um, without conservation actions, it probably would have been, would have been a bit worse, um, although the legacy really is quite small there. Um, the Prediction of, of its future in 10 years, I'm afraid it's going to look broadly the same as it is. You've got highly fragmented, tiny populations with very little reproductive productive potential. However, there is a lot of anti-poaching um, efforts going in and therefore uh, its prediction in terms of its, its where it would be without conservation is probably extinct in the wild. And some predictions around its recovery potential in the very long term, which is pretty modest, it has to be said. So this rather look un, unattractive looking graph um, gives you, therefore, the categorizations of legacy. It's fairly low. Conservation actions really haven't been that effective. It's But it's highly dependent on the conservation actions now and over the next 10 years. But we can't really see much conservation gain um, happening over the next 10 years. It's a very long lived species. It's just and it's, as I say, highly fragmented. There is not going to be that much reproduction, but perhaps more confident about a medium level of recovery potential in the future. Let's take um, a species of mangrove in East Asia. Um, the red list category is least concern. So you'd think maybe, you know, that's that's a species not being particularly terribly impacted by man, but actually in this case, it's been moderately depleted through conservation, uh, through human actions. And you can see here this sort of fuller conservation story now through this, this green status assessment. And you can see here um, where it is today, a species of recovery score of about 50 odd percent, 57 percent, I believe where it would have been otherwise without conservation actions, where it might get to in the future. And again, this um, this graph at the top, you can see this on the on the on the red on the red list website. Weirdly, all the different conservation impact metrics of legacy dependence and gain and potential all set coincidentally at medium. So medium, you know, level of conservation dependence, medium level, but we can still expect lot reasonable levels of recovery in the near term, in 10 years, but also in the future. And let's go back to our California condor. Um, you'd be perhaps unsurprised to hear that the species remains critically endangered despite lots of conservation efforts to uh, reintroduce it into the wild, back into the wild, but critically endangered today, but not critically depleted. It comes out as largely depleted. And again, its conservation story, as told through its green status assessment, is uh, formerly 1950s, right at the brink of extinction. It absolutely would have been extinct um, because it had it did go extinct in the wild, and without uh, captive breeding and reintroduction, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't exist in the wild today, of course. But again, along this species, long generation times, don't reasonably expect it to be looking anything different in the next ten years. But highly dependent on conservation actions but with a really promising recovery potential over the long term if conservation actions continue. So then again, you can see there's, diff there's four different conservation impact metrics of legacy, dependence, gain, and potential, giving you a much richer story than just purely the extinction risk assessment, assessment about the past and future for, for conservation for this species. 
And here's a, just a screenshot from the red list that gives you an idea about what that looks like. As I say, there's about, I think there's about 40 species that you can go and look at. And annoyingly, you can't filter for the green status assessments only. So you need to know which ones they are. But the big plan is, of course, to expand those out to many hundreds of species in the near future. So the benefits of green sets of species, really good for communicating conservation success. Um, in my previous job, I worked on this species for, for many years, the mountain chicken frog of East uh, Eastern Caribbean, critically endangered species. Um, it's basically, uh, be, we've worked on it for, for about 15 years. It remains critically endangered. So the story in itself isn't particularly promising, but without conservation actions, this species would have gone extinct in the wild. And also it has, if conservation actions are shown to be effective the, in, in the long term, it's got huge recovery potential. So again, that green state assessment allows us to tell, actually, there is some conservation success here. It would have gone extinct, extinct if it wasn't for conservation actions. And it also, the benefits of the green state species, um, uh, highlights the need for continued conservation actions. There's a perverse incentive in the red list, um, in, in the red list, is because if you down downlist your species from um, in the in terms of the giant panda, it was downlisted to, to vulnerable quite recently. Um, there can be a perception, therefore, this species is doing fine, and um, therefore funding perhaps isn't as needed um, uh, as it once was, um, and therefore uh, assessors or program teams are really sometimes reluctant to to do these genuine downlistings because they feel that a lot of their conservation um, support might, might disappear. However, we need to really show that it's con continued conservation actions for many species around the world are essential. And if they're withdrawn, if funding withdrawn and conservation actions don't happen, then that, that those hard fought conservation victories are essentially going to be lost. So finally, therefore, um, I we just wanted to think about, uh, we talked about the global level, just touch on some of the work we've been doing at a program level. So back to our friend, the California condor, this is its green status um, uh, assessment. Um, but this this shows the, the estimated impact of all conservation actions on aggregate globally. And can we use this framework to estimate the impact of specific actions or specific programs? I'm just gonna to touch on two examples of that before wrapping up. So practitioners have a really have a need and have had a need for a number of years that hasn't been fulfilled to assess the Im impact of their conservation actions of species recovery, both in the past and in the future. And there've been examples I worked on using the Red List Index, a big uh, biodiversity global indicator at an organization level um, to understand the impact of conservation organization, in this case, the Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust, but it's not particularly um, uh, relevant for different sorts of organizations or different sorts of conservation programs. So there is no standardized approach for assessing program impact on species. Um, so we asked the question, can the OCN green, green state of species, if this, this global framework be adapted for use at the program level? So just to first of all, touch on what we mean by a program in this case. And what we mean by this is a well-defined set of conservation actions, typically with a common vision and goals, delivered over a specified geographic scope, often to a specific budget, but then delivered over the long term to drive the recovery species. It could be led by a single organization, but more commonly in conservation, particularly in threatened species recovery, it will be through a partnership in multiple organizations. So it's, it's what, this is what we mean by a program. This is the sort of thing we're assessing. So the benefits of doing this, um, really for policymakers, they can, particularly when we're looking at future conservation scenarios, show with the right sort of backing and the right sort of policies in place, um, uh, what the recovery potential for species is in the future um, and, and how a programme could contribute to that, to that recovery. Massively important for NGOs who want to know if their work has been effective over the long term um, and indeed to, to help support plan, planning conservation actions and also, of course, to um, convince donors that um, their, con their conservation programmes are worth investing in. But also the public, we really, you know, we're really keen on on, on getting stories out there, but just about how effective conservation programs can be to move away from rather doom and gloom narratives around conservation to show past impacts of programs, but also the potential for future impacts. So again, let's look at the, the California condor, but in this case, single 
program, the Baja California program, um, which San Diego Zoo were heavily involved in. You, many of you probably know the history of the California condor, but threatened by habitat destruction, um, poaching, and latterly lead poisoning. Um, almost wiped out. 22 individuals remain taken into captivity um, and uh, to found a captive breeding program. Lots of programs working collaboratively and reintroductions in multiple sites across its range. And we just wanted to understand and use this as an example, quite a simple example, of what is the impact of the Baja Californian program in terms of its contribute to the global conservation effort to this species. So lots of work to define what we meant by the program, but I won't go into the detail of that. But essentially, it is this reintroduction down here, down in, in northwest Mexico. So we ran a program level um, green status uh, assessment um, within the context of that global assessment. So here's the global one, all conservation actions. This is where the species is today in terms of its species recovery score, where it would have been without those conservation actions. And we, what we wanted to assess is the role of the, the program within those historical, with, within that historical journey, that historical impact. So the Baja of California, basically is contributing this amount to the global conservation effort for this species. So quite a simple example, but the work, as I say, is in its infancy, but we can quantify that contribution of the Baja California program to the global conservation effort. And then lastly, I just want to talk about a program that I worked on for a number of years, and this is the Round Island Restoration Program. The Round Island is a small and uninhabited island um, which escaped off the north coast of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, escaped the worst impacts of rats in particular. So it had a relic uh, reptile fauna and bird and avifauna as well. And it's been subject to a long-term restoration um, uh, plan over the last 30 years and if removing other invasive species, um, promoting vegetation recovery, species reintroductions and so forth. So we were interested in understanding the impact of the Round Island Restoration Programme to drive the recovery of a particular species, um, and that is the, the something called the Telfair skink. So essentially, the Telfair skink was completely um, annihilated um, from its indigenous range um, across mainland Mauritius and the offshore islands, only surviving on Round Island. Um, uh, so uh, really only, only surviving there because both rats and mongooses didn't get onto that island. So it's constantly under the potential threat of predation by non-native mammalian predators that if they got onto Round Island, it was once, as I say, widespread across the island of Mauritius, remained just on that offshore island there um, off the northern coast of Mauritius, um, subject to long-term restoration and biosecurity in that island to promote the recovery of that species. Once that population rec recovered sufficiently, um, by around about the mid 2000s, we're in a position then to do start to do reintroductions on to other islands that had also been subject to restoration efforts down here uh, inshore in the southeast and also in uh, in also off the north coast. So, what impact has that Round Island program had on um, this species? Well, here's the global uh, picture. Um, it would have been extinct without conservation uh, actions preventing nasties getting onto Round Island. Um, there is what where it is today. And actually, the program legacy equals the global conservation legacy because essentially we're working on the global range of the species. But what we can show now is in the future is that Round Island conservation effort is how important that is to the future of that, of that, uh, of that species. So looking 10 years ahead then, um, we actually don't expect a huge amount of conservation gain, if any, over that lifetime, because it's going to require lots of um, further um, island reintroductions, uh, island restorations, I beg your pardon, to facilitate reintroductions. Um, but without cons if conservation actions were removed from all those three islands, we could reasonably expect that species to quickly decline to extinction. But here you can see the program, the impact of the Round Island program. So with conservation actions, that species should um, be where it is today. But again, remove biosecurity, remove the ongoing uh, habitat restoration efforts, and would expect decline, but not extinction of that species. So we can see the dependence of that species on that Round Island program effort within the global context. Right, um, that's 
it from me just about if you want to know more um i really encourage you there's a lot of um, scientific literature around the green status uh, of species there's the iucn standard and the guidelines document there's some information on the iucn um, main websites but also on the red list website and for certain species like the charming pygmy hog here you can actually go in onto the red list website and look at that that green status assessment and to tell which tells a much fuller story about the conservation um, uh, successes and, and future for this particular species. But also just a flag that coming soon is gonna be an online training module um, that's been developed that, I'll, that uh, is aimed at potential people that are interested in becoming green status assessors. And again, if you want to know more, I'd very much encourage you to um, contact my colleague, uh, Rebecca uh, Young at Darrell, if you want more information. Uh, I hope that was all clear. And um, uh, yes, I'd love, a, love to hear from you in terms of your uh, questions and comments. Annie, back to thank, you. Thank you very much, Richard. We have got lots of questions um, in the chat and comments, um, <clears throat> but it's great to hear emphasis on success rather than the doom and gloom that we hear. And I think that's a really important um, takeaway from this talk. Um, Drew, the first... Um, question was yours um, about um, how do you source your baseline data basically when defining a species previous range what are the typical sources you might go to um, for this um, and he says for something more cry cryptic for example a bat species mm -hmm. um, I mean the Quick answer is with difficulty. Um, uh, for some species, it's it's really not possible, and we have to recognise that. Um, but a range of approaches have been seen to use, although it is it is subject to ongoing research. So, um, certainly diving into the historical literature is one approach. Um, so, looking at um, uh, verifiable uh, records of the locations of species in the past, um, that's been that's been done for species which are, have interacted with humans a lot with, because they've been hunted or because of cultural importance, um, right through to approaches where essentially you're backcasting um, species distribution models. So looking, if, if you know something about the habitat associations of a particular species today and can make some assumptions about what they would have been in the past and you have some understanding of how those preferred or those um, those habitats were distributed uh, in the past, then essentially you can make predictions of what that indigenous range might have been, right through to making some pretty gross assumptions actually about, um, as I say, the historical ecology of the species and where that might have been. But in certain, certain circumstances, it's actually incredibly difficult. We've got a, a working group that's just purely, that's, that brings together uh, conservation scientists and practitioners with paleoecologists to try and come up with a kind of, with a, um, a framework or an, a, a more standardized approach and guidance about how you might do that. So that's definitely work in progress and not something I know terribly much about, but those are, are two examples, I guess, about how you would try and reconstruct the ecological histories and those indigenous ranges of, of species. Okay, and Emma, asks, do you use a particular software like QGIS or R to calculate the species recovery score? And mm. is this open source? Um, so at the moment, the template, the, the workbook for the basic calculator for doing, for doing the, the, the scores, for calculating the scores and documenting all your assumptions and all your supporting evidence and documentation, that, that sort of thing is, um, a, 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 a fancy Excel workbook. That's all it is at the moment. And that is, yeah, absolutely open source. And um, you can contact my colleague that I had those yeah. contact details up for. Um, but of course, the supporting information, a lot of the the mapping that goes into the background, that will be done in whatever GIS package you might um, want to use. Um, so GIS is definitely an important part because this is obviously a big spatial process. Um, and a lot of the maps then are kind of, uh, then uploaded into that workbook is supporting information. Ultimately, the assessors will be able to use something called the, the species, the SIS, the Species Information Service, which is a piece of software that sits in the back end of the red list. And at the moment, that's been modified so that you can you, you can basically you wouldn't have to rely on a workbook. There's a more intuitive 
a module within that that you'd be able to do your basic your green status assessment. Yeah, I think there will always be a mapping component you'll have to do in a piece of GIS though you know, to support it. Okay. Sally um, asks, what do you see as the relationship between green listing and favourable conservation status? Yeah, I'd love to give a really good answer on that, but I don't really know because we've not looked into it. Um, so it doesn't necessarily align with one another as far as I understand the favourable conservation status framework. Um, so um, that would be a really interesting piece of work, I think, to kind of to have a look at it, um, particularly when we're looking at sub global levels. The majority of the effort um, to date has purely been at global level. So thinking about the global range and populations of species. So to what extent you can translate that down um, to kind of presumably this would be, these would be large national designations or regional would be a really interesting piece of work to do. So I'm, I'm sorry to the question. I don't have a particularly good answer for that. Okay, um, and Gemma says, how do you assess the conservation legacy actions and their success? Yeah, a really good question. I would encourage you to go and look at that paper that we put together on how you build practical, robust counterfactuals. It's, it's using inferential, what's known as inferential approach, so essentially it's a logical thought experiment, but you are... Um, uh, essentially, you're pulling together data as much as you can on populate um, various parameters of a population <laughs> or conservation actions were were put into place. So you'd be interested in, in population sizes, uh, ranges, range declines, population decline uh, trends, um, threatening processes, how uh, the scale of those threatening processes and how severe those impacts are likely to be look and then really try to start to attribute conservation actions to changes in those to think about what the impact of those conservation actions like to be and then you do a thought experiment about removing all those conservation actions and then you with a set of assumptions we should declare you then try and work out what state that species would be in across your different spatial units and therefore what the species recovery score would be today if it were not for those conservation actions the difference between the current and the counterfactual then is your is your conservation legacy. It's not always possible to do because you don't have enough data or you're too uncertain about some of your assumptions and therefore your conservation legacy could be indeterminate or indeed the conservation intervals essentially around them are so, so wide it's, it's not particularly meaningful. But what we showed in the testing paper actually that is more often than not it is really plausible. Those thought experiments really hold up um, and so it gives you, you know, a good guide about about the, the scale of that conservation legacy. Okay, I, usually we, are, we um, ask people to, if they want to ask their own questions, but I'm really aware of the time and we need to finish at seven. So I'll carry on reading them out. Uh, Rosie asks, um, says you mentioned that assessing ecological functions specifically can be challenging. Could you discuss further about what that makes this challenging? You know, what? I was really hoping not to get a, a question on ecological functionality because it's really not my area. Um, but I'll give it a little bit of a go. But I would encourage um, the questioner to look at that paper that sort of sets out um, an approach about and, and definitions of what we mean by ecological functionality. Um, so I, I, if I go on from there, I think I'll probably be guessing. Um, so I won't. But there are. There are definitions in there that were about the sorts of different functions you could be thinking about that a species would, um, and the sorts of different interactions that a species um, would be responsible for, um, but also some proxies for ecological functionality. And more often than not, you really don't know what functions uh, a species may perform because it's just not sufficiently well studied. And you need to use proxies about basically pre-human impact densities uh, where you'd reasonably expect those functions to be playing out or indeed for species which have parts of its range where haven't been particularly impacted by human by human actions, you know what uh, the typical population densities might be in similar habitats, but also what kind of demographic structures that might be, and uh, what processes and behaviours that 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 uh, population um, may perform, where you'd expect those ecological that therefore that species to be functional. That's a really probably very very poor answer. So please go and read that paper by written by people who know what they're talking about or not. 
Okay. Another question from Drew. Um, can you group species within the green status listing to see which geographical areas or habitats show the most recovery potential and are therefore most likely worth investment? Hmm. That's a really good species. Uh, species. That's a really, really good question. And it's something we've only just started touching on. In principle, you probably can. One potential problem is that, of course, you basically, as you map the indigenous range of a species, you then have to make some decisions about how you subdivide that into these so-called spatial units. And you can, there's red list criteria around how you define what you mean by subpopulation, and you try and use that where you can. But invariably, it's a bespoke uh, subdivision uh, or a um, uh, yeah, the subdivision of its indigenous range into these into these different spatial units, which probably won't align with other species that could be co-occurring in that particular part of the world. That said, you could definitely layer them and therefore within those, look at where you might reasonably expect a whole suite of different species to be uh, to have a higher conservation gain or a higher recovery potential. So I think in principle, and I'd really like to explore that particular question further because I think that's really interesting. Okay, um, another one from Rosie. Are there any papers or resources on the Californian condor and round island conservation impact assessments? Uh, the short answer is on the Californian condor, I don't know off the top of my head. I could, despite all those conservation actions, I'm not entirely sure what how extensive the literature is on that. Uh, yeah, a, a Google search will quickly tell you. Um, I mean, it's it's a flagship iconic conservation effort, uh, you know, recovery program that's cost millions of dollars. So I would imagine there'd been some level of evaluation there, whether it's in the public domain or not, I don't know. Um, there sorry, are- I can, I can actually answer that, Richard. Great. <laughs> <Right. laughs> sorry, having having done some research on that myself. Um, yeah, so if you go onto the um, Audubon website um, and look up the California condor as a case study, there's a load of links to papers there, which um, will hopefully be of interest to Rosie, which are um, publicly accessible ones. <laughs> Yep. Uh, and then on the Telfair skink, the uh, Telfair skink one in particular, um, there are not many. One, there's one paper I can think of that I can find the details of um, after, when I've finished speaking um, that charts the recovery of that species. Um, and there hasn't been as much scientific literature um, developed around the Rana Restoration Program because it is absolutely fascinating. But there are one or two um, papers dating to about 10 years ago that kind of that do talk about some of the, the prior history um, for that um, restoration effort. The Red List account, I can't remember for the Telfair skink how well developed that is. Um, but I, um, again, was that, was that Rosie was that asked the question? If she wants to get in touch with me, then I can, I can actually send her some materials that might not be in the public domain for that particular species. Right, and Rosie has asked in the in the chat how to spell Audubon. It's A U B A U D O B O N, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, the other, the last question is another one from Emma who says thanks. There are a few other thanks in the chat for you, Richard. Good. Um, but um, Emma's currently doing a wildlife conservation master's um, and would like to know how she can become a volunteer to help collect species data for the project. Amazing. So she should contact my colleague, Rebecca.young at Durrell.org, and I'm sure she'll be delighted to hear from her. Okay. Does anybody else have any pressing questions that they haven't put in the chat or any comments they'd like to make in the last um, two minutes before we wind up? Okay, well, I'm going to ask one, Richard. Okay. Um, conservation effort, conservation success. Are you taking into account economic factors? So because simple... value value for money mm. um, is is something that maybe would be useful to put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, with the Round Island project, um, I'm sure that for the reintroductions there, you've got to do um, species eradication programs. Mm -hmm. 
hugely adding to the cost. Yes, although essential, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the short answer is no. It, within the green status framework, there is mm -hmm. no uh, consideration of cost at all. Um, so, but that's because it's a you know at, at the heart of it is a global um, assessment framework. So that would require basically talking to multiple conservation actors um, to try and get hold of cost information, which would be practically impossible. However, at the program level, which we're just starting to develop at the moment where you could reasonably expect somebody to have the financial information um, that describes the, you know, the, the costs of a, an ongoing programme, historical, historical, historically and ongoing, uh, and potentially into the future, where you could actually line up, yeah, cost with both past and future impact and get some kind of return on investment type of metric for that. So that would be possible. It's um, a hugely under explored, under studied, under published area of conservation science, actually truly understanding both the costs and impacts of conservation actions at, at, at different sorts of spatial and temporal scales. It's, can, I think if I was to have time to invest in research, I think that would be it probably because it's so essential. And I've had so many conversations with policymakers and funders in my past job where you get that question, well, yeah, but what's going to cost in the future? Yeah. What does that get you in terms of conservation gain? Um, and is that value for money? But of course, without something like the Green States of Species Assessment Framework, there is no standardised way of, of measuring past impact, gain dependence and recovery potential. So that's the starting point by which you can layer on the cost and then think about kind of integrating those two things together to look for value for money. Uh, because when you're looking at, you know, what what could be achieved with conservation effort, it's how much what's required in terms of resources to do that. Indeed. Yep. Big question. OK, okay. Mm. right. Um, so we have now um, one minute to go. So I will just quickly say thank you very much, Richard great talk i'm sure everyone agrees with that um all the comments in the chat too many to read out to saying thank you very much great presentation and i will just say our next program of events starts again in january we don't have anything in december january february and march uh, march will be our um annual general meeting so we hope to get a special speaker for that um, we don't have January speaker confirmed yet, but we have Tom Morehouse um, speaking in February, who has just published a book <clears throat> called Ghosts in the Hedgerow about um, hedgehogs. And if anyone hasn't um, hasn't read it, it's a very clever uh, way of presenting um, hedgehogs, the need for conservation. But the book is written as a murder mystery. Uh, which is, a, I, I think it's, um, I think it's great, you know, what is causing the decline of hedgehogs. And like most things, it's, it's a combination of factors. Um, and he makes the point very clearly, we have no valid baseline. We talk about hedgehogs being in decline, but we don't have a valid um, baseline and we don't have good survey data now. So um, come along on the, um, I've forgotten the date. It'll be the third Thursday in February. Um, and here, Tom giving a brief summary of his book. Um, and I recommend it as a good read. Okay, um, thank you very much. The chat is um, <clears throat> running away with itself. Um, saying thank you very much, Richard. Thank um, you very much, Richard. You're so, very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> So with that, we'll say um, thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who came along. Hope to see you again. Uh, oh, um, and we'll stop recording. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.